Hello, welcome everybody. Very excited about being here with you today on our Conscious Leadership Forum. Uh, I want to uh, basically uh, hope everybody had a wonderful 4th of July that's in the United States. And for those of you around the world, I hope you had a great weekend. And uh, it's time to, to focus on ourselves. One of the key things that I'm excited about, uh, I spent like over the holidays, I was with great friends and we talked a lot about consciousness and being able to to really be fully alive and present for the moment. And, you know, so many people are distracted and we have so many things happening in the world. We're connected to the world through the internet, through our computers, through our phones, through TV, um, through blogs, through a whole bunch of different ways. And, you know, I, obviously some very serious things happened during the world this weekend, you know, things that weren't so good. And those kind of things bother us and they have an effect on us and they can really give us time to kind of go inside here and start to think about, well, what does this mean to me? How does this affect me? How does this affect the world? Is the world getting worse? And all this stuff is just part of what's going on in the world. It's not really us. It's our interpretation of that. So it's never been more important to really focus on kind of working on ourselves. You know, I, I talk a lot about the mental gym versus just the physical gym. If you want to get healthier, you need to go to the physical gym and you need to do it consistently in order to stay healthy and be fit, cardiovascular fitness, uh, weight resistance, all the things that are important. And if we don't do it, our body basically responds in a negative way. The same thing with our minds. Our minds were designed to protect us 10,000 years ago. Uh, and yet today with all the stuff going on, including these, these tragic events of the last weekend, if we don't know how to process, we don't understand how to take that information uh, and be aware of it, understand it but not allow it to affect us emotionally to the point where it in incapacitates us, uh, we could be in trouble. And most people are in trouble in their, their mind. Their emotional mismanagement is causing all kinds of dysfunction. And so we wanna talk about that today, but before we do that, I just wanna show you a couple things that are going on. You know, We've created uh, easier ways for you to focus on your mind. I, I'm now doing a blog. You can go to drwayneanderson.com uh, for recordings and, and perform transcripts. So everything we're talking about today is permanently uh, memorialized for you. And of course, there's no, no charge for it. We, we want to make sure that this is a forum and a place where you can work on yourself unabated uh, and you have access to that information. I want to show you now, uh, many of you know that last month I was in London uh, recording and filming uh, conscious leadership and consciousness uh, and focusing on our self-awareness and our management. And so I wanted to uh, now uh, roll just a little snippet of some of the work that was done over there uh, and some of the work you can look forward to because I always want to give you video support and things to help you. So let's roll this. In order to create optimal health and well-being for yourself, we have to ask ourselves a lot of questions. And we have to decide that I want to do this. It's much easier to stay in the space you've been in, the comfort zone, right? Life is okay. Life is fine. I'm doing okay. But that's not really where life is. We were put on this planet for a very short period of time. And I believe it's to optimize ourselves, to become more. And I know you have it inside of you. You have such greatness inside of you. And no matter what happened in the past, your future's in front of you. And we can help take you on that journey. It's not going to be easy. You're going to have to sit and do this day in and day out, just like you don't get in shape physically overnight. But the practice makes perfect. And anything can be changed with practice. I don't care what your situation is. I came from a relatively modest family. And I live a life most people only dream of now. And it's taken a lot of work. But I can tell you, spending the time working on yourself may not seem like immediate benefit, but it'll come pretty quick. It'll come because you'll start to change your relationship with yourself and also with others. And when you build that internal stability where things can't trigger you, where you sit back and look at everything using this beautiful thing that we're the only creature on the planet that has access to, which is this treasure, this gift we have. And if we're using this versus that Labrador, that emotional, that reptilian brain, we can change everything and everybody has that. We just have to understand how it works, how we can modify it, and how we can put it in position to serve you. Because once this serves you, and no longer the emotions, these long-term emotional love people serve you, you're now in position to change everything. And that starts today. 
Okay, so I hopefully that was uh, you guys like that. Put a put a one in the in the chat if you enjoyed that, and uh, the more and more will be coming out on that to help you. And I saw a request: can I share this with my clients? Yeah, we're going to make that's what it's designed for. It's designed way beyond uh, the traditional mission that we're on. It's designed for anybody that's interested in improving their health and well-being. So I just want to refresh because it's been a month or so. Uh, our forum basically is designed a place, a meeting, a medium where ideas and views on a particular issue can be exchanged. And so, you know, today, really excited about talking about understanding our personal mind. Now, if we think about it, consciousness is basically referring to the state of being aware of one's surroundings, the things around us, our thoughts inside, and our feelings. So just as a review, consciousness of awareness on the outside is this is the way our brains were designed. They were, brain, they were designed to fully take in what was going on in the present moment. 10,000 years ago, you were fully aware of everything because it was important for your survival. And if you look up and just look at animals in general, they're always very, very aware of their surroundings. And that was important for us to take this uh, data in. But besides that, we have our inside world, which are awareness of our thoughts and our feelings. And this is where I want to talk today about our personal mind versus the creative thoughts that we have. So we are designed, our prefrontal cortex, I mentioned it in the film, is designed to truly allow people to fully create anything they want. It's a brilliant mind. It's the analytical. It's actually um, has the ability to create executive. We built, you know, skyscrapers, uh, airplanes that can fly with 500 people on them. Uh, we're going to, the, we've been to the moon. We're getting ready to go to Mars. So that part is the part that Einstein you know, used incredibly well. And it, we each have that. And I think it's so important for us to understand that because we all have this part. Unfortunately, what we do is we get stuck in our personal mind, which is all about what's, what we like and we don't like. And it keeps us from using full access to this incredible part. So, you know, our creative thoughts are willful. We have the ability at any time. Right now, if I said to you, okay, what is two plus two? You could immediately, and obviously it's, that one's a pretty simple one, but you would immediately be able to take that prefrontal cortex, do that executive function and say it's four. Boom, just like that, because you have the willful ability to do that. We also have the creative process and auditory. We can actually think in our mind and actually listen and sing or, 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 or say something where we actually feel the sounds and we can create with that. We have the visual part where we can create. I can right now say to you, visualize what's in your refrigerator. And you would immediately go into your refrigerator in your mind and visualize what was there. And it's brilliant. It's, it's incredible. And it's the area that I talked about in that little video is the part that allows us to have unlimited potential to truly create what we want and organize our life around what matters. But then fortunately, there's other thoughts. And those thoughts include everything from automatic thoughts where we're just spontaneously, you know, you're in your car and you're thinking, oh, did I turn off the stove? And that's the voice in your head. We have that voice in our head that just kind of always telling us what to do. And by the way, just so you know, we're not going to talk about that much today, but it is 99% of the time incorrect. It tells you stuff that just isn't true. It creates paranoia, neurosis, and all kinds of things for us because it's made up stories. Stuff we make up, we fill in the blanks when we're not sure. And it's about our self-concepts. So, that's our personal mind. We each have one. We have our own individual. It's unique to us. Nobody else has the same personal mind. When we see experience something and we see something outside, we can either experience it just as it is, or we can interpret it with our personal mind. Usually our stored trauma, our negative thoughts, our dislikes and likes, they all modify how we think about something. So we're no longer looking at the world objectively. We have our self-concepts. We may like something and we may dislike something. And according to that, that's how we act. We don't truly experience it. So I'll just tell you a concept that I just saw a little while ago. I was walking down the hall and my dog, uh, my Labrador retriever, black Labrador, Finn, Finley, and uh, Savannah's cat, which, you know, basically my own personal uh, concept is uh, I'm not that much into cats. And I apologize if you are. That's great. I'm not into them because I'm allergic to them. And I just find them kind of offsetting. You know, I, I like the, the feeling of the domestic dog sitting there, you know, licking your foot. And maybe that's part of in here, but that happens to be my life. But I saw, and the concept is that dogs and cats fight, right? They hate each other. Tom and Jerry's, we were growing up, you know, all those things where cats and dogs don't get along. That's a concept most of us hold. Yet I looked at him and that cat, Stash, 
was sitting there literally licking the Labrador's um, ear and snuggling up to him. And as I conceptually walked down the hall, I said, what a brilliant, beautiful example of how we conceptualize the way the world should be. But it isn't necessarily like that. And by observing it, looking at them, I noticed that they like each other. So that's where our personal concepts or our stereotypes, so to speak, get in the way and have us interpret what happens through our own personal story of it. We make up what we think should be happening. So that's really important to understand. So in the moment, bottom line, if a rattlesnake is rattling next to you, just like it was 10,000 years ago, because there were a lot more uh, things that could hurt you, bottom line is you would react, have fear, fear is an emotion, and emotion triggers action. The action would be you would either freeze or you would run, you would get out of there. So it does service in the moment, these things that are built into our brain. They're there for a reason. And the, the Labrador part, the emotional part of our brain is important. But what happens, unfortunately, is we store the trauma. We, don't, we have that fear, but we don't fully process because it's uncomfortable. And then we start thinking about snakes. And so we resist it and we store it. Now, some people, it's good in your memory that you recognize that down in that bush, there was a snake. Great, you don't, you avoid that bush. That's proper memory, that's how it was designed. But to start thinking about that snake all the time and anything that resembles a snake, you know, you're walking down the road uh, and there's a rope and you see a rope on the ground and all of a sudden you either look and see, oh, it's just a rope and you move on or it triggers in you that trauma and all of a sudden you're scared of that rope and you're thinking about it. And all of a sudden this beautiful walk you're having in the country because you saw the rope is now totally diffused. And now all you're doing is thinking about that. So basically, if we think about it, if you're in the garden and you're afraid because you're worried about snakes, you're not going to have a pleasant experience. And gardening is one of the most meditative ways to relax, enjoy nature, and be part of it. So hopefully this is starting to make sense. We have our stored trauma, things inside that affect us way beyond even, and we modify things when reality is no longer there. And we have anxiety. And we may carry anxiety about snakes to the point where we don't go in the woods, we won't walk in the desert, we won't even go to our garden. So it's important to start to understand how our mind thinks, how our personal mind literally gets in the way for us able to really truly enjoy life. So here's another one. You know, and everybody, you know, when you see this picture, you everybody goes, ah, because you feel joy. You know, you feel this warm feeling of innocence of a puppy. And we want to cling to that. Clinging is the same thing. You enjoy the experience, but then not move on beyond it. So give you an example. Let's say you and your spouse or your girlfriend or boyfriend, you know, or just a friend uh, went somewhere on vacation and you had this incredible experience. You had a beautiful sunset and you remember that, or you had, you know, something happened that was so in intense that it was just incredible. So now, rather than just letting that happen and enjoying it for the moment and moving on and experience what happens next, we now start thinking about that. And you may get to the point where, you know, people spend more time planning their vacations than they do their life. And so rather than being full and present, you're thinking three weeks from now, I'm going on vacation and I'm going to enjoy and have that same experience. Well, I guarantee if you're clinging to that and you're conceptualizing what that experience was like, when you go on vacation, you are going to be disappointed because you're now creating way that experience should be. And if the food isn't as good at the restaurant or it's cloudy or it rains one day, all of a sudden, this wonderful time that you anticipate you're going to have doesn't actually happen. So it's really important to understand how our mind does that. So what we want to do is get to the upper, the upper photo, unfiltered, being able to at every moment be present, be able to fully be aware. You know, it's, it's not that we like everything that happens. And if we don't like something as it's happening, but we let that experience happen. So if we are scared because of that snake, have that experience, feel it and go, Phew, that was a close call and let that go totally, totally through us versus resist it. If we filter and resist things, as you can see all those cogs, that's why emotional mismanagement is just dominates most people. And people can't even sleep at night because they've got so many cognitive emotive loops going on. So our triggers concepts that things should be a certain way. These are unfinished mental and emotional patterns. So they can be great. They can be stored resisted or clung to either way the idea is we want to learn how to release those so our voice in our head as you know is something that's telling you what the way the world should be or giving you a story 
most of the time, which is in Craig. And here's an example. You know, let's just say, going back to relationships, let's say your significant other uh, basically is doesn't 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 answer when you uh, when you text them or call them. And you start worrying, well, what's going on? And maybe the weekend before you were out at a party and uh, they were dancing with somebody and it seemed just seemed in your head they were dancing a little, little too close. So now all of a sudden you're making up this story about how basically, you know, what are they doing? Where are they? And you're anticipating it. And then there's this hour and then all of a sudden you get a hold of them. And your mind was telling you all these negative things, your voice in your head. And yet what your spouse was doing actually when you got home was preparing an incredible surprise party for you for your birthday. And all of a sudden, oh, you're so joyful. And yet the next morning, your voice in your head, you're fully believing it again. So it's really important to start to understand objective reality, being able to see everything and witness, including your thoughts and your feelings is the first step. So consciousness of our inner world, awareness is critical because events, people, and something's gonna happen all day long in your life. And what we do is our ego, our personal mind takes over. And what it does is it creates these automatic thoughts. And the automatic thoughts create these emotions. And these emotions create the drama triangle. And that's why 95 to 98% of people are in the drama triangle all the time. And so what they're doing is they're projecting or expressing outward. If you're upset with someone because they didn't talk to you, you may express it and project and say, hey, Sam, you know, I, I said hi to you. Why didn't you say hi back? And what you're doing now is you're projecting something that's your stored trauma inside, your self-worth or whatever, it doesn't matter. And now you're getting into Sam's stuff and now pretty soon you're in the drama triangle again, or you resist or cling. And this is what most people do. Rather than that, they start thinking, oh, well, Sam doesn't like me. I can't believe it. I've been so good to him. And we start to resist or cling if it's something that's good or if it's something that's bad. But the point is we suppress these things and then we have all this stored trauma. And now when something happens, rather than just experience it unfiltered, we filter it through that process. And what we do is we create internal instability, which then translates to external uh, lack of equilibrium in our relationship. So hopefully this has been helpful. I'm going to stop sharing now and now open it up for questions. So with that, uh, let's start off. Rachel, who do we have? Okay, we have Faith. Up first, Faith, can you come on camera and unmute yourself? Hi. Hi, Faith. Hi. Thanks for taking my question. So um, I spent a great portion of my life uh, taking feedback as an emotional thing, I've recently realized. So um, growing up and, you know, no shade on my parents, it's just how I grew up. But feedback was either a manipulation or maybe shame-based. And so in my adult life, I found that feedback with, with my business or other relationships has been really emotional for me. And that, so recently I realized that that's a thing for me <laughs> and it's a journey to uh, not have it be emotional. So do you have a journey of oh, how you started taking feedback in a neutral way or any tips or tricks on how to do that? Yeah, great. Thank you, Faith. So first of all, uh, your parents were doing the best they could do, right? And that's the first thing. It's uh, acceptance, forgiveness, and not clinging to the past or, or uh, thinking of the past. So that's the first thing because, you know, they were doing the best. They didn't know. You know, I mean, I, listen, I went through the same thing. My, you know, I, I remember how my parents, you know, was brought up. The second part is understanding that everything that happens in your life is happening as experience and a growth mechanism for you, right? So it's fine that you recognize it's just now not beating yourself up for that. You, know, you realize there's an emotional tendency and you look at, pro you know, whether it's your self-worth uh, or feeling because, you know, when we're little, especially around the age of till about five or so, we don't have the ability, our cognitive areas aren't developed yet. And so we don't have a rational brain. Anything that happens to us, we take full value. So that stuff gets imprinted, engrammed into us. So we have those stored trauma in us. It's all in there. The first thing and the part for me, and by the way, you know, I, I had the same thing. And so I really uh, self-soothed myself. I became very, very, actually, it's part of my success. And I'm sure it's been your success is that you take care of yourself. You know, you become your own person and then everything is reflected from that. And you're in the proving or the stage where you're trying to make it right, right? You're trying to create the ideal reality uh, conflict resolution, but it's impossible because if you think that way of yourself, it doesn't matter. You can, you can win the Nobel Prize. And you're, if you think you're stupid, 
you can be the first in your class, you know, uh, honor society, win the Nobel Prize. If you think that, you still think that. In fact, why would somebody want to do that unless they want to prove that they weren't? So the first thing is realizing that our thoughts and our feelings aren't us. And, you know, obviously, the questions you're asking is you're on a journey of self-exploration and growth. So, so what I, I can tell you is that my ego was very important. And, and you, I think you're a physician too, right? I am. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, you going through medical school, doing your internship and your residencies, there was a lot of determination and willpower that you used to do that. And here's the cool thing about it. Doesn't matter those mechanisms, they served you at the time, they served you right up till right this moment as you and I are talking. And what's cool about it, and that's the thing is right now, boom, you can make the decision that, you know what, I'm not my thoughts, I'm not my feelings. I am this brilliant mind inside of here that's going to now create the life in the future that I want, organizing it for myself and for the people around me. I'm going to become fully present and I'm no longer engaged in allowing those things, those concepts that are in there to now have energy. You know, it's, it, it's about feeding those. So, you know, Stop, Challenge and Choose is the most primordial thing. You know, I created that a long time ago, but it's great because you, you're inside of you. You know, when that happens, your body is going to, right at the beginning, you'll feel that icky sauce, right? You know what I'm talking about, right? And when you feel that, you can stop. You can actually stop and say, okay, why am I feeling that? And just, is it, it what, what's the emotion? And then fully express it. It only takes about 90 seconds. You know, our, our, our emotional um, uh, coherence is about protecting us. It's about, it, you know, opening up our heart um, to be able to uh, fear when we need to, when the rattlesnake's there, but not go beyond that, allowing that to be, oh, I recognize that. So the first part is the mechanical part of understanding that, okay, I'm going to have thoughts and I'm feelings. They're not me. They were removed from me. And the more faith that you can move yourself back, it's almost uh, in the object, it's called, you know, basically the objective seed of consciousness, where you're able to recognize you're not your thoughts. And what's cool about it, if you start to have that feeling, if you kind of move yourself physically back from that, that's the first step. So it's the self-recognition, the self-awareness that starts the process. And then the fun part is the self-management, which is, you know, the, you know there, there's a whole bunch of work done, but most of it is really about either changing a negative into a positive. That's, you can just shift it and say, so the example I like to use is, you know, let's say you're in a 25 mile an hour zone and you have this person driving 20 miles an hour behind you or in front of you and you're sitting there and you can either start buying into that the frustration like oh what are they doing you know how can that be and getting more and more upset or you can say okay i'm gonna it's gonna take me another five minutes if i'm gonna be late i'm gonna make the call because i'm not someone who's late so you defuse or debunk that concept just say hey we're in traffic i'll be there a little later and then spend that extra 10 minutes listen to a podcast sitting there relaxing if you're doing a presentation or going into a meeting or seeing a patient basically say okay how how can i now be better prepared for that so it's really that's the easiest one because you can just switch out right are we are negatively biased we have a tendency we tell three people something positive and 33 people something negative it's just the way and that was teleologically designed for us ten thousand years ago and what happens is the drama cycle is a sense of you know, whatever news station you watch, they're all doing the same thing, right? They're pointing fingers and they're built into that adrenaline rush that's occurring because they feel alive because they're pissed off, right? Or we're blaming somebody. The same thing happens to us. We can either sit there and say, okay, uh, I'm going to get more upset about this and start building up. And we know emotional mismanagement is the leading cause of death. So if we can just stop that and put something positive and say, oh, great, I got another five minutes to do this. And then change. That's the first thing we can do. The second thing is we can actually get to the point where we recognize that this is our pattern and that's what it is. Our life becomes likes and dislikes. It's a series of patterns that we have decided inside that make life right for us. And when those things happen, as we hope, life is beautiful. But most of the time, life is going to happen in a different way than we want. So it's going to be dealing with hostile people, a scared patient, uh, somebody that's got secondary gain and they're, they don't want to get better. They actually love that you're spending time with them. And your ability, you know, as a physician, I'm not sure what specialty you're in, but the bottom line is just being able to be aware of that in our relational. That's what I talk about, external equilibrium. It allows you as a physician 
working or with your patients or your clients or your coaches or your business coaches, it allows us now to remove ourselves so we're not engaging with their stuff. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks so much. So appreciate yeah, it. Yeah, and just one last thing, because I think, you know, actually I, I talk more of in there about your external things with other people. Re the journey really starts within, and I know that's what you're really asking me. That journey is a matter of just becoming so self-aware multiple times a day. And the other thing is catch yourself and just take a moment and say, okay, where am I right now? And you can use the traditional things of where's my breathing? Is my breathing down from my belly? Is my belly going out or is it shallow and up here? Am I in a, you know, just as a physician to physician, am I in a sympathetic tone or a parasympathetic tone? Parasympathetic is our default mechanism. It's our ability to be alert, calm, relaxed, everything flowing, very alert or the sympathetic, which is that adrenalized where we're now charged, breathing shallow, stressed, tense, jaw, all those things. And learning how to just separate that because you know what to do once you recognize that. And it's just that self-awareness of being able to move yourself back from being, not getting into the rapids, you know, not getting into, you know, I talk about uh, the rapids, the rocks being the concepts in there, all that stuff, which we all have, by the way, no one's, uh, uh, I have it just as, I have them all there too. I'm just learning each day to be better at recognizing them and not allowing them to affect me. And the best way to do that is that very first moment before you go down the rabbit hole is to sense it, take some deep breaths, change your posture, relax, bring your shoulders back. And then you're sensing that you are not your body. You are not your thoughts, or your feelings. You are the conscious awareness that is able to manage those things and then start putting them in position where it's much easier. And over time, things that bother, you'll see that. That'll be the first indicator. You'll see things that would bother you before no longer have any effect. And I like the analogy. I heard this many years ago, but it's like water on a duck's back. That stuff, all that stuff that used to get to you will start just rolling off you and you'll be aware of it, but it will not have an effect on you. Yeah. Well, wonderful. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. My pleasure. Thank you. Okay. Who's next? All right. Next up, we have Denise. Denise, can you come on camera and unmute yourself? Hey, Dr. Anderson. Thanks for taking my question. Um, actually, Faith's, uh, your answer to Faith's um, question probably pretty much answered mine a lot. Um, when I get um, with uh, pre-clients, when I get um, into some conversations and um, negative um, feedback in reference to just sharing the program or something like that, um, uh, just wanted to get some tips on um, moving from that point of where you kind of get silenced um, in um, what you really are excited about. You don't want to go over the overkill and seem salesy. Um, I, I think a lot of tips you just gave as far as just the, the physical stepping back um, really helped me a lot, but um, I wanted to um, be more, I guess, be more bold and not be silenced in their uh, concept of what they think I'm trying to say. Okay. So, um, yeah. Okay, so let's, do, let's just, to make it easier, let's just take an example. T give me an example. Um, well, just the example would be, um, well, I think I, you know, I'll just try to do, you know, eating six times a day on my own or, um, that's, you know, that's too expensive just for a diet. Oh, okay. Um, okay. I get it. Yeah. yeah. So, so what, what, you, what you're, what you're saying, well, first of all, you are in command of yourself and in leadership. Um, whether it's in business or in, in personal, it starts with yourself, right? It's in, it's in your self-awareness and self-management. That's the first part. So you're allowing people outside of you to affect you and, and bother you. And um, so you're making it about yourself. The, the key thing is to understand the creation and the creator. You are, you are the creator. You're the one that's creating this, this new way of living, this new life, this new business. But you're not what you're creating. You are simply the person that's making it happen. Okay. So when you have a potential client, whether they decide to use the program or not is immaterial. And that's how you have to look at it because we're not salespeople. We share and care. We don't sell and tell. So that it bothers you when they give you a response like that is because you're basically trying to get them to do something. 
remember, we can't, you cannot, you can't help anybody change their behavior. You can't tell somebody what to do. What we do is we make them aware of the benefits to them so it makes sense for them to do it. So I, I never play mental ping pong with anybody. If someone's, you know, if someone says, well, so this is what I, this is a simple way to address that just in general with exactly specifically your question. I always ask people, if you could choose optimal health, would you make that choice? And most people will say, yeah. Some people may kind of hesitate and I'll say, no, no, I'm not saying, do you think you can live? You know, if they're hundred pounds overweight and struggling with it for 20 years, they probably don't think they can do it. And that's not what I'm, so that's what I'd say is Sally, that's not what I'm asking. I'm asking you, if you could choose that, would you make that choice? And the answer is yes, great. Then all of the rest of this is showing you how we're gonna help you do that. See, in other words, that's where I keep it. If they're sitting there making excuses because they don't want to do it, they're not ready to do it, then that's okay because they're not going to be successful using uh, our program right. if they do that because it starts here. They have to they have to have self awareness, raise their hand, and be willing to do it. So that's the first part. Whether they're ready or not is is not you, your your job. Your job is to to hopefully uh, empathetically, which means meet them on their path, ask questions and help them become aware of what's important to them. So that's what, that's, that's what I always focus on. And my, my goal is not to make a sale. My goal is always to, when I leave the conversation with them, they will reflect and say, you know what? I gained something there. I gained something there. And whether they, you know, there's, well, just in the United States, without thinking of 8.5 billion people in the world, there's 330 million Americans uh, 80%, but well, probably 90% of need what we have. So I'm just looking to find the people that are ready. And so don't try to convince them. Don't try. But, but what you can do is ask questions. So if they say, well, I'm going to do it on their own and say, um, you know, well, that's great. You know, how, how are you going to, you know, do you understand how to do it? Can I help you with that? Even that part. In fact, if you look at the habit self transformational system, I specifically put a whole section in there where people don't have to use the feelings. They don't have to join uh, the, the mission from the standpoint of the commercial part, they can do it on their own, or you can help them do it with using the books. It's designed specifically like that. What I'm always looking for is to lower resistance. And it's normal. Resistance is high right now, most people, because people don't want to be controlled. They don't want to be sold. I can tell you if my phone, if I answer my phone, and there is a delay of le more than two seconds, I'm hanging up. I'm not even getting into a conversation with someone trying to get me something I want. So you have to understand that's the climate we're in. What you're looking to do is to share and care and let them see that you're trying to, you are helping them if they're ready. And if they're not, it's okay. And don't, don't take that personal. Remember, your creation is not you. It's not, don't have a feedback loop of, oh, the person said, no, what does that mean? I'm terrible. No. Remember, if someone shot you in the head today, it's not about you. I mean, it would hurt, mm -hmm. but it's about them, right? And so it's important for you to realize that you're a messenger. You're someone that's becoming a professional at helping people create better health and well-being. And you know a lot more than they do. They don't need to see that you know a lot more. In fact, the whole idea is to ask them questions so that you have them become aware where even in the conversation you're having, they may not today be ready to say yes, but as they reflect and get off the phone and they see how much you cared and how much you want to help them, Bottom line is they'll think about it. And then when they're ready, they'll come back. Mm -hmm. Make sense? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. You, 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 you're a beautiful thing. Yes. Yeah, separate yourself from what you're doing. Thank you so much. So welcome. Okay. Rach, who's next? All right. Next up, we have Denise. Denise, can you come on camera? I'm here. There you, are. Here. There you are. Hey, hey, Dr. A. So I've seen you model this and I've watched you in conversations with people. You pick up detail, you are fully present, and I know you're brilliant, your mind is going. So my question is, how can I slow down for others? They ask a question, then they repeat it a different way. Then they explain, I got my nurse practitioner code on, I already got the answer. And I'm missing the details, but how can I get better at that? Yeah, well, that's a good question. It's not that I'm brilliant, it's just that I've learned how to listen. You know, it's it's really critical. You know, the 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 whole the whole point 
and especially now, you know, and, and that's what this forum's about. Uh, you know, my work has taken me, you know, first obviously reacting to disease as a critical care physician, and then learning about physical health and all the stuff I wrote about in the habits of health. But what I realize on this journey, the more I'm on the journey, the more I understand that it is in here. It's at six inches. And the key part, the first part, the part to have any kind of credibility is to build rapport. And it's truly just simply being open, curious, and want to grow. So, you know, I, I love the analogy. I'm, I know you've heard this, um, but I like, I'm curious, you know, everybody's on their own planet, like just I showed with the personal mind. Everybody sees things differently. And for us to have the perspective that, oh, okay, I know what, I, what they need, has nothing to do, it has nothing to do with it. The most important skill you have as a coach working with someone is to listen to them and then to guide them and to have them understand how you can help them. But it's important that they're heard first. It's, it's, it's listening to understand before being understood. It's a critical part of the skill of building rapport. And the idea is that you can only help someone to the level they want to be helped. And even though it's kind of like, you know, it's going back to the basics in, in the very beginning, you know, I, one of the earlier, you know, 15, 20 years ago, you know, when you become a coach, all of a sudden you look out and, you know, 68% of, of the people in this country are overweight or obese. So there are walking targets that you know you can help. But if you're even thinking about that and you understand that because you've been a coach for a long time now, is that until they want to be helped, you really can't help them. So the same thing in the dialogue you're having with people, they need to get to the point where, first of all, they see that you really care. And number two, that you set up boundaries of what you will and won't do. So in other words, if they go on and on about uh, their problems, what I'll do is redirect that and say, okay, I understand. You know, and then that's why we have upset technology and we use little questions like, you know, what happened, what's missing, what's next? And what that does is that takes someone that's in the drama triangle, used to reacting to every family member, every, all their friends, and every time they do that, they get in an engaged drama triangle conversation, which makes them feel alive, and they get upset, or they get sad, or they get pissed off, and so they think they're actually doing something good. What they're actually doing is they're trying to solve a problem, and the bottom line is solving a problem doesn't create anything. It just gets rid of something you don't want. So the whole idea of the creative process of learning how to be fully conscious is going into that process where we're engaging this brilliant mind we have that can create skyscrapers and do all these marvelous things and make sure we're using that. And our role and goal is to help them re-engage that as well. So how we do that initially, especially in the beginning, is we focus on what they want. You know, it's all about organize your life for what matters and what's most important to us. So to do that, I'm always redirecting them to that point. So, you know, if someone just just like Faith, you know, uh, you know, being a fellow physician, I, I, I know the journey she went on. It's, it's not an easy one to become a doctor um, and requires lots of perseverance. And in that role, we're up one down one. We have patients and they listen to us. And so now she's going to a very different world where she's partners, where this this thing is no longer she's in charge. She's the authority. And they're the patient, right? Scared to death. In fact, by the way, in traditional physician relations, because it's all about numbers now and technology and not as much about rapport, this, this is not working anymore. That, that's why Optavia physicians have become incredible as, at helping their patients because they're now approaching that from a human to human. Yes, giving the, the knowledge and the understanding, the skills they have, but doing it in a more cooperative way. So it's a dance, right? It's a dance of working with others, but helping them recognize that you're adding value to them. And, you, and the thing is, you'll really enjoy it, Denise, when you actually have that happen, because they'll be much more receptive. See, anytime you want to take over and tell, people don't want to be told what to do. I mean, the whole thing with masks, the reason why people didn't wear masks, they didn't want to be told what to do. We're so over-controlled. So it's recognizing as a coach and becoming a transformational leader, it's all about listening and having them see that in this relationship, Yes, I'm setting boundaries. I'm going to move you back because my role is to coach you, not to talk about how the dog had diarrhea today. That's that's not my role. My role is to help you move forward. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. And I, I you know, I've seen over time, like Brad told me, Denise, take the white coat off. Because in the beginning, I just came in and told him, yeah. you're, you're obese, your BMI is too. That's just was my training. So yeah, now but, but your training, okay, your training was reacting to disease 
tell them because they're scared to death because they're about ready to die or something. And then, yeah. so they would listen for a short period. But anytime someone is emotionally charged, go to the doctor told they have diabetes, it doesn't work long-term because they lose 10 pounds and then they feel better than they stop doing it. The whole thing here is to build relational health for they understand you are their partner, you're their advocate, and you're going to give them guidance that will help them. You're not doing it. They're, you're not doing it for you. You're doing it to help them. And that's exactly right. It's a, there's no white coats involved in this business. This business is about caring and sharing and basically giving people value that helps accelerate their movement towards success. Thank cool. you. You're welcome. Okay, who's next? All right, next up we have Shauna. Good morning, hey, Dr. Anderson. Good morning. Who do we Good have? Good morning. Here? What's your name? Chase. Hey, buddy. How are you? Good. You having fun? What? Cool. <laughs> yeah, summer break. Um, I want to thank Denise, Faith, um, and Lisa because I think you know what they asked. You covered a lot that leads into my question, but you had mentioned something in the in the opening is that we make things we make things up or stories as we see the world should be happening around us. And I've recently, within the past few weeks, um, heard my mentorship talking about habit loops, um, which I think is a lot of what you're covering right now. So during the speed of growth, you know, in coaching and helping clients and helping change the world on this mission um, and leveling up, how can we accelerate consciously overcoming those habit loops that are no longer serving us and our future vision? Yeah. So, so habits, you know, basically habits are there. They're, they're neural pathways. They're uh, what wires, you know, fires together, wires together. So they're there. You're not getting rid of those loops. You're simply ignoring their importance. And so you have to look at each individual situation. If you have a loop where you have a tendency to be a know-it-all, like Denise was talking about, right? Being, a, You have to realize that it's not effective and it doesn't work. Um, people people need that's why the whole habits health transformational system uh and it's its evolution now is focused on the client taking control right the first one was the coaches would have to do a lot of the training on the head this one is all about the client taking control so in that what you're looking for is to help people build in the understanding of pattern recognition and habits are simply uh recognition of behaviors that we do when we're stimulated a certain way and so we have to decide most habits are great you know so when, you know, when you're driving your car, when you first learned how to drive, bottom line is you had to think about everything, right? The turn signal, the brake, you know, put your foot from the accelerator to the brake, watching around you, the rear view mirror, uh, the position uh, turns. I mean, if it's raining, there were so many things in the beginning that were so hard that now you do naturally. In fact, you can get, do it so naturally that you become unconscious that you're driving, which is not good either. And that's why they took away the idea of the hands uh, cell phone because people get so immersed in their conversations, they weren't paying attention or texting or anything like that. Your primary thing when you're driving is to drive the car, but it all becomes automatic. So you have to ask yourself, okay, what things are, so well, first of all, the bottom line is anything that's stored inside us where we uh, have a preference of the way the world needs to be lowers our effectiveness because here's the thing the, the this prefrontal cortex that i keep pointing to it we're the only we the only animal in the in the um, the earth on this planet that has the ability to do that yeah some can do conversation but we have the ability to be aware of our awareness we're the only uh, creature that does that and that's why we're the only creature using this brilliant prefrontal cortex that's been able to create and move beyond our our, our, our sub circumstance so the primates in the jungle or in Africa are still the same as they were. They haven't changed any. They use the same tools, basic tools, and they haven't evolved at all. This part is what separates us, what gives us the opportunity. And that's what I'm so excited about is people moving in. We all have that. But what we do is we use it for this constant personal mind battle of what the way the world needs to be all the time. If we can actually separate that and move it out so we're actually focusing on what creates the things that are important to us, then we're tapping into this area. But what, and that's what Einstein did. Einstein didn't care how he looked. He wore old clothes and stuff because he was focused on using this abstract, incredible mind to create wonderful things. What we do is we spend so much time trying to get the world the way we want the world to be. So any habit loop that you have that creates a pattern where you do something which is negative or doesn't serve you or doesn't serve you working with your clients or your coaches or your business coaches, 
is not effective. And so recognition, so it's always the process of self-awareness of how am I responding to the input that's coming in and then self-management and then the creative process. So the more we can destroy habit loops of relationships and things where we're now experiencing, just what Denise was talking about, when we can stop being the doctor or the nurse or and, and then and being my identity, but now be one human listening to another human with all this knowledge we have that we're learning as being coaches, we can be a very effective at helping them. But it can't be about us. It can't be about us saying, well, I did it because we're all on a different planet. Since you were born, you stored all these experiences and every one of us, those experiences are different. So to think that because you think a certain way, or know what you need to do in a certain way, that that's how they're going to respond to it is just absolutely personal mind, ego-based, and it has no 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 place it should be in us telling anybody how to be, what to be, or how, what they should do or shouldn't do. It's about having them become aware to take ownership and become the personal uh, navigator or architect of their own life. And that is about becoming aware. It's about presence. We miss so many things. Just like, you know, um is that your son yeah that's my one of yeah. them okay, so, so what what grade is he in what grade are you in second. second okay so if he comes home from school and you basically spend five minutes with him right when he comes home let's say you're on a call and this is what i do with my girls you know i, I obviously you know i have a pretty busy life and i remember when they were young like second grade they would come home and they wanted to tell me what was going on and I would actually stop calls. I don't care who I was talking. I'd say, hey, listen, I'll call you back in five minutes. We'll get this done. I just, my daughter just came home. But them hearing that and seeing that just created an environment. And I can tell you, three minutes after you're paying attention to them, they're bored with you. They're ready to move on. But it's understanding that, that awareness, that understanding of presence, whether it's as your mom to a son or you know to a client, to you, you as a coach or to a business coach. It's about being aware and being present in that moment. And if you can't do it, make the, you know, make the uh, decision to let's do this like 10 minutes from now, or let's do it tomorrow. You know, right now it's not a great time. So you start becoming so self-aware that you're able to perform at a very high level. That's the most important part of coaching anybody else is first self-awareness, personal, personal leadership. So now you can help others uh, develop in the, in the same way. And by the way, you become an example of calmness you're no longer agitated or dry and you're not being drawn to the drama triangle because that's not what you do you're not effective if you, you be a hero or you're the villain oh yeah that's right you're right they were right the company should have done this and they should have done that no that's not your role your role is to have them become self-aware of why they're interacting with you which is for their health and their well-being i feel that and that that talk of presence i'm finding myself asking am i present right now like in my head because you can feel the pull of a hundred different thoughts so yeah. it's really recentering and you know investing back into what you're doing thank you yeah, yeah no and one thing Shadow, you just brought up which i think is important for everybody to understand our our consciousness is our focus it's our awareness and living in the world we're in today there's so many distractions right at multiple different levels uh, th mostly through that's why i'm not against technology technology machine-based technology can serve us but it's actually human transformational technology that can actually serve us more. And that is being able to adapt so that we're using technology to be able to put our mind where we want, when we want, for as long as we want, and having the resources of that technology to amplify that to have better reach. So I'm not against technology. I'm just saying that most people are distracted by it and they're not present. I mean, I have to tell you, like, you know, you've seen this. You go to dinner, out to dinner, and you're sitting, at, you're sitting watching the table and the parents are on their things, the videos or their phones. The kids are on their iPads and nobody's paying attention to each other. And that is that is a massive tragedy because those kids need that nurturing and that social interaction, that understanding of love and caring. And it can't be isolated to technologies because technology is neutral, it doesn't have personnel, it doesn't have emotion, it doesn't have human connection. So does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Right. Thank you. Cool. Awesome. You're welcome. Okay, who's next? All right, we have Kimberly next. Kimberly, can you come on camera and unmute yourself? There we go. There you are. Hello, Dr. A. Hi, Kimberly, how are you? I'm good, thank you. Um, so that was perfect setup um, with Shauna's question. Um, 
because talking about self-awareness, I'm wondering how do we discover or um, recognize uh, the underlying stories or filters that might be in our blind spots? Yeah, well, that's that's a great question. It, it, it's usually what happens is, well, let me, let me back up. You have a huge capacity at the unconscious level for storing data. So, and that actually brings up an important thing I wanna make sure everybody understands. There's a difference between memory and stored trauma, you know, concepts. Memory is simply your, your, your mind in specifically in the hippocampus creating an understanding. So, you know, you know, if I see you again, Kimberly, I'll immediately say, or sometimes I have to pull it, it may not come right away because I haven't seen you that much, but then I think, oh, okay, mm, that's Kimberly. So that's memory. And that's, that's good. That's important. And by the way, if you know, you're walking on a trail out in Arizona and there's an area with one of those swore cactus and there happens to be a rattlesnake nest there. It's good to remember it's there. And so you avoid it. But what we do is we basically store all the stuff inside of us, which we either liked a lot and don't want to let it go, or we didn't like, and we don't want to fully let it in. Both those things create dysfunction for us. It creates disequilibrium. It's our storage garbage. It's garbage. Most of it isn't even helpful. But what happens is it gets triggered and it gets triggered because you have this huge, you have the, the conscious level, the area you're aware of, and then you have all the stuff underneath. So the important thing is you're not going to be able to get rid of all this stuff inside. But if you become aware, what happens is it'll start bubbling up because it's energy. Remember, emotions are energy and they're stored. It's blocked energy inside of you. And so they'll keep, if, if you, every time it happens, you repress it, you know, address it. So, you know, for people that have been divorced, but they, but they can't go to a party where their ex is at, they haven't divorced them. They're still in their mind. Once that's been removed and they're beyond it and they've let that go, they can go because it doesn't matter anymore. They've separated themselves. They're not physically with that person and they can basically let it happen. But so many people that, so that's an uh, extreme example of what happens to us every day. We have so many things in here and we have a life of things that have been put in there and we're not going to ever be aware of all of them, but they're general themes. And what, what happens is once you start realizing and identifying when you have, when I was talking earlier with, with faith, when you feel that icky sauce, when you feel something doesn't feel, let, let's say you're walking down the street and all of a sudden you're with your spouse or your significant other and you're talking at a wonderful meal and a, a, a red Mustang goes by. And all of a sudden you just turn sideways and all of a sudden you're quiet, you're repressed. Your spouse is saying, you know, what's going on? And you may not even know what it is. But what happened was in high school, you had a boyfriend with a red Mustang and he dumped you. And so now even that will stimulate you. But as soon as you recognize I'm having a wonderful evening, as soon as I recognize, oh, I'm starting to feel weird, okay? Then stop. Why am I feeling that way? What's going on? Oh, a red mustache. Oh, okay. And you let that come up in 90 seconds, it'll be gone. Otherwise, if you try to repress it, not address it, it goes down in there and it just took your affect totally away and you're no longer with your spouse. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. So it's all that, it's all, it's all a, you know, it's like going to the mental gym. It's that when things happen now, and, and the other thing you can help yourself, which I was talking to Faith about, is just make sure that multiple times a day you're checking in with yourself, right? Am I, where am I right now in my awareness, right? Am I fully buried? And listen, it's fine. If you're doing a project or at work or whatever, and you're in here working, that's fine. Your awareness is doing something using your prefrontal cortex, which is very helpful. It's when we let the other stuff, all that stored stuff now engage with what just happened that sends us off. And we can spend our whole life trying to make the world the way we want the world. The world is the way the world is. What happened over the weekend is tragic, but it happened. Basically, what can we do and what can we do? Yeah, we can be sad for those families. But bottom line is for it to now come in and start to overwhelm you and create worry and anxiety. Now you're not serving your family. Does that right. make sense? Totally, yeah. totally. Yeah, as far as with the business, like I've I've been doing trainings and things and, you know, you think, oh, hey, I've, I've uncovered that. I've peeled that layer of the onion. Okay, now I'm aware of this thing. But then it, it gets sneaky. <laughs> it gets oh, sneaky and it comes your ego, in. Your ego, oh, no, your ego has been protecting you since you were a little girl. It, it, it does not want you to become aware. 
it, it will fight you and try to create stories. And, you know, that doesn't matter. And that doctor doesn't know what he's talking about. And it'll go on and on and on. The deal is you have a brilliant mind. You have will, your will, and your will can put you on this journey towards better health and well-being and it change everything. And it can happen that quick. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Cool. Awesome. All right. Well, we're out of time. Uh, this was great. Thank you guys for all your questions. I really appreciate it. Please uh, put in the chat and Rachel will take this information. Anything I can do to make it better, anything we can do to extend. The idea is to, to move this out and, and uh, allow you to have all your clients and candidates and friends uh, come join us in this forum. We want to build a, a huge forum where people can come and ask their question, be understood and help us all become more aware and then create self-management and optimization over time. So God bless. See you guys. Bye.